In a matter of three weeks, the Russian aviation industry slid back three decades. With one rambling justification and a subsequent brazen invasion came a cascading series of implications that brought the golden era of global aviation cooperation to a screeching halt. As a 21st century Iron Curtain fell across Eastern Europe, Russian commercial aviation began reverting to a bygone era. An era marked by tension, by distrust bordering on paranoia, and by extreme and utter isolation. Throughout the Soviet era, the nation's aviation industry was defined by stark insularity. While air traffic controllers and pilots around the world spoke English, those in the USSR spoke Russian. While Western countries benefited from innovation born out of competition between private aerospace companies, technological advances in the USSR fell entirely on the state. Soviet planes, like the Tupolev 104, equivalent to the de Havilland Comet, and the Tupolev 154, equivalent to the Boeing 707, were the intellectual output of a centrally planned OKB, or an experimental design bureau, while their construction, maintenance, regulation, and certification all fell under the purview of the centralized Ministry of Aviation Industry. While much of the rest of the world's aviation industry coalesced around a sprawling set of standards, a host of trusted aerospace companies and carriers, and a spattering of supranational organizations like the International Civil Aviation Organization, the Soviet Union turned inward. Domestic flights dominated Soviet commercial aviation. Flights from Soviet capitals, regional hubs, and vacation spots composed much of state-run Aeroflot's routes. Across the post-Stalin era, Russians traveled increasingly by air for business and pleasure, but rarely did they leave the confines of the USSR. Though Aeroflot at its height serviced over 100 countries, only select Soviets, diplomats, athletes, scientists, and artists saw the outside world with any regularity. For the business traveler, international trips hinged on their ability to prove the travel was absolutely necessary and the ability to pass extensive background checks. For the average Moscow resident with a hint of wanderlust, well, there was Sochi, or Odessa, or Dombey. Of course, strict rules over what went out also informed what went in. Inbound international flights, when allowed, were bound to specific, sometimes suspiciously circuitous routings. Incoming visitors were given strict travel itineraries, and closed airspace was closely monitored, in the case of Korean Airlines Flight 7, to tragic consequences. Closed airspace built walls in the sky. Walls which created a world of separated worlds. One where cities like Anchorage became international hubs. One where the Soviet aviation industry and Soviet travelers existed separate from the rest. One that current events have us poised to return to. Just hours after Russian missiles began tearing across Ukrainian skies, it became apparent that it wouldn't only be Ukrainian airspace taking on a new atmosphere of hostility. The same day the invasion began, the UK Department for Transport banned all civilian Russian aircraft from its airspace. Direct Aeroflot flights from Moscow to Heathrow would be no more. If Western powers weren't going to directly intervene, they'd lay sanctions. And as during the Cold War, Western powers again identified commercial aviation as a means of inflicting economic pain on the aggressor. In the following days, the European Union, Canada, then the United States, among others, banned Russian flights from their airspace. Russia, for its part, responded in kind, closing its airspace to the 30-plus unfriendly countries in a tit-for-tat move. Walls went up, and an era of unprecedented peacetime mobility slammed shut. Aeroflot, which just days before had operated international flights as far east as Tokyo and as far west as Los Angeles, announced on March 5th that its only international service would be into the capital city of Minsk in allied Belarus. European and American carriers began diverting routes so as to avoid Russian airspace. Russian airspace that US airlines typically crossed an average of 1,400 times a week. Flights like Lufthansa's LH-716 from Frankfurt to Tokyo once arched over Siberia, but now cut south through Central Asia. In the most indicative example of the rapid backslide into Soviet-era aviation norms, Finnair announced it was dusting the cobwebs off this circuitous route from Helsinki to Tokyo, one last flown in the late 80s, adding more than three hours of flight time but avoiding Russia entirely. When, if ever, these walls go down is anyone's guess. What is certain, though, is that redirected flight patterns and a return to an almost exclusively domestic route network marks only the tip of the iceberg as to the long-term impact of Russia's invasion on Russian aviation.
Beyond the growing divide between Russian and global skies, the country's aviation industry is also experiencing a new digital divide. You see, whether it be a hotel in Zanzibar, a rental car company in Jeju, or a regional airline in Guatemala, the entire world of travel is all connected by the global distribution system, the GDS. At the simplest level, the GDS is a common, connected way to communicate and book inventory between travel providers. This and other back-end communication is crucial for airlines in particular since they rely so heavily on bookings originating from third-party online travel agencies like Google Flights, Expedia, or Skyscanner, and also on selling tickets that include flights operated by other airlines. When a passenger flies Delta from Seattle to Amsterdam then connects on KLM to Athens, Delta and KLM systems need to communicate. If they didn't, the passenger wouldn't be able to get their KLM boarding pass when checking in in Seattle, they wouldn't be able to check their bag all the way through to Athens, they wouldn't be able to get help from KLM if a Delta delay led to a misconnection. Back-end communication is crucial for the cohesive travel experience from airline to airline. Now, GDS software is essentially run by three companies, Amadeus, Sabre, and Travelport. Combined, they hold the market outright. Therefore, the announcement that all three GDS providers were suspending Aeroflot's access was considered a death blow for the airline. This decision was guided by the fact that Aeroflot is a majority state-owned airline, and so Aeroflot revenue would go directly to the very entity funding the deadly invasion of Ukraine. Now, without access to the GDS, Aeroflot flights no longer appear on Google Flights, Expedia, Skyscanner, or any other online travel agency. To book, one must go directly to Aeroflot's website. In addition, and perhaps more crucially, Aeroflot flights can no longer be booked as part of itineraries with other airlines. While most international airlines have suspended service to Russia, Middle Eastern carriers, namely Turkish, Qatar, Etihad, and Emirates, have emerged as a crucial air bridge for the country, one of the few convenient ways in or out, especially when heading to Western destinations. Etihad, in particular, used to coach here with Aeroflot, allowing a passenger to book a ticket from Abu Dhabi to Moscow, then seamlessly connect onwards on Aeroflot to Sochi, for example. Without GDS, this is no longer possible. Therefore, there's no easy way to travel from outside of Russia to anywhere beyond the destinations of those few inbound international flights, essentially anywhere but Moscow. While privately owned airlines in Russia have yet to be removed from the GDS, all restrictions combined mean that Russia's relative distance to the world has now dramatically increased. Traveling from London to Murmansk, for example, used to be thoroughly simple. A three-hour Aeroflot flight from Heathrow to Moscow, a one-hour connection, then a two-hour flight north to the Arctic city. Now, however, the most efficient way of that journey is likely a full 10-hour travel day on Turkish Airlines from London to Istanbul to Moscow, an overnight at an airport hotel, then a morning flight the next day on Aeroflot to finally arrive in Murmansk. That's to say, the fastest way to get between two cities a mere 1,600 miles or 2,600 kilometers apart now takes longer than flying from London to Sydney. But even for those flights that can operate for those passengers who are able to book, there's an open question as to whether there's going to be the aircraft to fly them. You see, while many might perceive aircraft as a product, as something sold from manufacturer to airline, increasingly, they're a service. A majority of the world's commercial aircraft fleet is now made up of leased aircraft, those owned by an outside company but rented to airlines for a term of a few years. Rather than getting on a years-long waiting list to spend a huge amount of working capital on a single aircraft, airlines have come to enjoy the flexibility of shorter-term lease agreements. It allows them to grow and shrink their fleets more easily in response to shifts in demand and pay for aircraft as revenue comes in rather than before. Of Russia's 980 passenger aircraft, 777 are leased. Of those, two-thirds, or 515, are leased from companies based outside of the country. Nearly all of those foreign companies are now either required to terminate their lease agreements due to sanctions imposed by their home country, or have chosen to due to a lack of faith in Russian Airlines' ability to continue paying due to the collapse of the ruble and the decimation of international route networks. Now, as aircraft leasing gained prominence in the early 2000s, a number of nations came together to sign the Cape Town Treaty. Like ships, for example, aircraft often spend much or most of their service lives outside of the country in which they're registered, so an Irish leasing company like Aircap, for example, can't rely on Irish law to give it the right to repossess an aircraft for non-payment if it was leased to a foreign airline and located outside of Ireland. Therefore, the Cape Town Convention made aircraft leases, and especially aircraft repossessions, enforceable by international law, 
it meant that Aircap had a legal right to ask the Russian authorities to help it seize an Aeroflot aircraft for non-payment or lease termination. That's, of course, because Russia is a signatory of the Cape Town Treaty. However, in this case, facing the loss of the majority of its civil aviation fleet, the nation just decided to ignore it. In fact, not only did they ignore it, but instead, Russia began a state-sanctioned theft of billions upon billions of dollars worth of aircraft. You see, the majority of the aircraft owned by major international leasing companies are registered in either Ireland or Bermuda, mostly due to tax advantages. Therefore, when those two countries revoked the certificates of airworthiness for aircraft logged on their registries but leased to Russian airlines, that meant that nearly all of those 515 aircraft were no longer legally able to fly and that the lessors wanted them back. However, in response, Putin signed a law allowing Russia's airlines to re-register these aircraft as Russian as if they were their own property. Essentially, Russia is telling its airlines to just keep the planes. As long as they don't leave the country, they'll stay in their hands. That means going forward, these aircraft will likely only operate domestic routes, while fully owned or Russian leased aircraft will operate any international routes. However, even that could become difficult. To retain their legal and practical ability to fly, aircraft are continuously subjugated to an extensive maintenance and inspection schedule. But now, both Boeing and Airbus have suspended all maintenance support to Russian airlines, leaving them few options for sourcing legitimate parts. Without legitimate parts, even legitimately owned aircraft could lose the right to fly internationally. And then on top of that, even the Russian-made Sukhoi Superjet, the most common domestic-made aircraft, faces maintenance issues too as its official part supplier is Lufthansa Technik, which is based in Germany, a country that has enacted sanctions preventing the company from supplying parts to Russian airlines. Now, there is precedent for this situation. Iran's aviation industry operated under similarly severe sanctions from 2007 to 2015. This resulted in them holding on to the aircraft they had prior to the sanctions long past their typical service lives. When an aircraft part went faulty, focus was placed on repairing it rather than replacing it, since nearly all parts replacement required cannibalizing from grounded aircraft. As time went on, more and more aircraft had to be grounded to supply parts to the flying ones, and the country's skies became some of the most dangerous in the world as safety standards grew increasingly relaxed. Russia is likely to operate under a similar system. Assuming it continues to hold on to all 980 of its commercial aircraft, it'll have an oversupply due to its airlines' inability to operate most in-demand international routes. But the longer the sanctions stretch on, the more planes will have to be dedicated to cannibalization, and the fewer there will be that can actually fly. Beyond the obvious, the absolute destruction of the progress Russian airlines have made over the past three decades building themselves up into legitimate, safe, respected global carriers, the near-total disconnection between the Russian and global aviation industries could actually accelerate progress for certain others. To start, between Sukhoi and Irkut, Russia has been attempting to revitalize its storied aircraft manufacturing industry, so far with little success as their aircraft have not been competitive with those of Western manufacturers. However, without the competition, these domestic manufacturers will become one of the only sources for new aircraft. This could also have a spillover effect for China, as their state-owned aircraft manufacturer Comac is nearing first deliveries of its C919 aircraft, roughly equivalent to an A320 or 737. If it's able to make a version free of parts from countries that have sanctioned Russia or China, which is a big if, Comac could capture demand from Russia that could not be fulfilled by Comac's primary competitors, Boeing and Airbus. But the implications go further than that. While the impact of Russia's airspace closure was dulled by weak international travel demand to and from Asia, with most of the continent's borders still closed in response to the pandemic, as this demand grows in step with COVID's fade, this could have broad, long-term implications on the global aviation industry. Finnair, based in Helsinki for example, has long taken advantage of their position in the northeast of Europe, on the direct path between most major European and Asian cities, to offer some of the quickest connecting itineraries between the two continents. In fact, prior to the pandemic, they were the only major European airline which flew the majority of their long-haul routes to Asia rather than North America or elsewhere. However, when Asian travel demand's return started to lag behind the rest of the worlds, Finnair announced that it would begin flying long-haul routes to destinations in the US and Thailand from Stockholm, a new secondary hub to complement its primary one in Helsinki. In retrospect, that seems an extremely prudent move, and it's likely the airline will continue on a similar strategic path. 
reallocating its resources westward in response to its quick flip from best to worst positioned for Europe to Asia flying. But as one airport falls, another rises. Elsewhere in the northern latitudes, Anchorage Airport might regain its strategic status for Europe to Asia flying. During the Cold War, Anchorage was home to one of the most cosmopolitan airports in the world as European and Asian airlines used it as a refueling stop, avoiding Soviet airspace. Routing a flight from Tokyo to London via Anchorage does add about four hours to flight time, but it is essentially the fastest route when overflying Russia isn't an option. In fact, Japan Airlines flights on that route have already started flying over Anchorage, although without stopping for fuel since aircraft now have longer ranges than in decades past. However, the more fuel you add to an aircraft, the heavier it is, and therefore the more fuel you have to use to carry the added fuel weight. Essentially, as flight distance increases, average fuel burn per mile increases. Of course, packages, unlike passengers, don't care about stops, so cargo airlines have long used Anchorage as a refueling hub on flights between North America and Asia. Now, however, it's become advantageous to use Anchorage as a stop on their flights between Asia and Europe as well. Nippon Cargo Airlines' route from Tokyo to Amsterdam used to fly non-stop in a quick 11 and a half hours, but the closure of Russian airspace has now made that entirely infeasible. Instead, it flies northeast for six and a half hours towards Anchorage, stops for refueling, then continues nine hours onward to Amsterdam. Compared to before, this requires four hours of additional flight time, but it's certainly better than the alternative. FedEx's route from Osaka to Paris, for example, normally flying a similar distance between similarly located cities, now flies 11 and a half hours first to Dubai, then seven and a half to Paris. 19 hours of flying for a route that previously took less than 12. If these airspace closures prolong, the airline might opt to route the flight through Anchorage, an itinerary that could save them two hours over Dubai. FedEx and UPS already have major operations at Anchorage, so it's very possible they'll start to expand the model that's worked for Asia to North America flying to Europe as well in this new reality. Passenger airlines, however, are likely to take advantage of modern aircraft's incredible range to continue to run flights to Asia nonstop, even if they physically route over Alaska. However, one startup airline is likely quietly celebrating the new inaccessibility of Russian skies. Northern Pacific Airways has announced its intention to start flights from Anchorage to both North America and Asia in 2022, with the goal of creating a connecting hub for trans-Pacific travel. Essentially, they want to become the Iceland Air of the Pacific. This startup does, however, face an uphill battle. Transatlantic fares are some of the highest-priced long-haul flights out there on a per-mile basis, despite strong competition. The market can sustain it since it's connecting one wealthy area to another. Trans-Pacific fares, meanwhile, are some of the least expensive on a per-mile basis thanks to fierce competition from Asian airlines that enjoy low operating costs and strong state support. Therefore, Northern Pacific Airways is unlikely to be able to offer as strong a cost advantage relative to the market as Iceland Air. However, especially for itineraries from the eastern half of North America or to the western parts of Asia, Anchorage has gone from a detour to directly on the route. Delta's flight from Detroit to Seoul, for example, used to take a 13-hour path over flying Russia, but is now having to route via a more southern 14-hour path over flying Anchorage. A passenger originating in Boston flying via Detroit to Seoul on this flight now has a roughly 19-hour itinerary. Northern Pacific, with 8 hours from Boston to Anchorage, an hour for a connection, then 9 hours onward to Seoul, will now be able to beat Delta by an hour. And even better, by operating two medium-length flights rather than one long and one short flight, their fuel burn per passenger will likely be lower, meaning they might be able to offer lower fares. Not only that, but they could now potentially expand their business model to Europe as well. A flight from Anchorage to London, Amsterdam, or Paris only takes nine hours, so coupled with a six and a half hour flight from Tokyo to Anchorage, the 17 and a half hour total itinerary would only be two hours longer than the new circuitous non-stops from Western Europe to Asia and would likely sell at a much lower cost. In comparison to an itinerary connecting from Paris to London to Tokyo, Northern Pacific's itinerary would likely be faster. Now, a European expansion for this as-yet unlaunched airline is unlikely in the near term, as their fleet will initially be composed of 757s that cannot confidently reach the major European airports, but if this new reality entrenches into the long term, it's certainly an option. At the very least, though, this has raised the business model's status from one met with resounding skepticism among experts to one now considered potentially feasible.
Now, the short of all these compounding implications is that, across the board really, from Western travelers to all strata of Russian society, these changes are going to hurt. The decisions of a few and the world's response to those decisions have ensured we'll all feel the squeeze of closed airspace and aviation sanctions. Beyond the economics though, February 24th, 2022 marks the end of a period of mostly sustained, mostly stable peace between world powers that allowed for unprecedented efficiency and standardization in the skies and unmatched mobility and convenience for the traveler. The three decades of uniquely open and accessible airways are over. When, or more accurately if we're to return to such a time, at this point is anyone's guess. If you're anything like me, you typically struggle to decide what to do at dinner time. Should I have unhealthy freezer food, expensive takeout, or a time-consuming home-cooked meal? Of course, I no longer have to make this decision since, for the past two years, I've used HelloFresh. That's because it's simultaneously healthy, affordable, and quick. Each week, I select the meals I want on their app, then the next, a box arrives on my doorstep with all the ingredients needed in exactly the right quantities needed. This cuts out all your shopping time and a lot of your prep time so you get straight to the fun part, cooking. For example, I made this delicious buffalo spice chicken in under 30 minutes. Also, HelloFresh is a more sustainable choice. Unlike the grocery store, they offset all their emissions, their packaging is made out of recycled content, and a University of Michigan study found that the pre-portioned ingredients lower food waste by 25% compared to grocery shopping. All around, HelloFresh just makes mealtime better, and that's why I've been using them since long before they sponsored the channel. I recommend you try them out as well, which you can do with an insanely good deal when you click the button on screen or go to HelloFresh.com and use code WENDOVER16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts.